episode one was prep before the prep, choosing your style, theme, and colors, designing and envisioning the piece, and then transfers, molds, um, blends, and all that. Two was finding and choosing your piece for fun, profit, and style. Three, that's today. We have prep and tools of the trade. We have paint, what kind, choosing your paint. Um, then we will have decor, and that's talking about the transfers, molds, blends, how much stuff to add to it, and keeping uh, you know the cost and everything in mind. Um, we will have number six will be finishing, like waxes and top coats and sealers, and then uh, number seven will be shipping or delivery and where to sell. And number eight is the bonus, but that's also where we'll go over how to price your piece and have your uh, business be profitable. And any questions that you have in the meantime, it, just put them in the comments, DM them to me, email them to me or whatever, and I will add those into number eight because I want to make sure that I am answering all of the questions that you, that you have. Okay, I think it's time to start, and here we go. Furniture Painting 101, Episode 3, Prep and Tools of the Trade. I have a good bit to go over here, so we're going to get started with it. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I do want to share as much information with you as I can here. Some of this will go over what we did last week. Um, I do want to add to this one thing that's important is having a planner. I, I'll put info on the one I use if you want. Or just at least a little notebook where you write down where you get a piece, where you bought the piece, how much you paid for it, what you're using on it, even the colors you're using on it. And having those records is good for your taxes, good for pricing later on, good if the customer wants to come back and match it, good to make, you know, to add up the, all of your cost and your labor and all that to um, come up with your final price, whether it's a custom or whether it's one that you're going to sell. For the pre-prep, this is um, where you have the dollies. We talked about these little furniture wheels that I use all the time. You can see the paint all over this one. I use those all the time. The big dollies, the furniture dollies, I like the ones with the wood strips that go all the way across, but whatever kind that you can get of those. Straps, flashlights, um, hydraulic lift. We discussed that last week. Um, either a trailer, uh, like a box trailer, uh, a store, climate-controlled storage, if at all possible, because your pieces that you store will absorb moisture and swell up. The drawers will start not working right. The veneer will start to ripple and things like that. And so climate-controlled is important. You don't have to keep it, you know, as warm as you would keep your house, but at least don't let it get too cold in there. Um, the hand truck dolly, moving furniture blanket, shrink wrap, again, the, those are ones that we covered last week. And then for your actual prepping of the piece, what I recommend, there's a million other things to use, and if you have suggestions, don't forget to, and things that you love, let me know about them so that I can include them in the ebook that, that goes along with this. Each week, we're taking all of these notes and putting them into a graphic. We're working on the blog posts that go with them, but there will be a free ebook at the end, and I'll, uh, it's not done because we're doing it week by week. Um, and, and then I'll send that out to anybody who wants it. But so if you have something that I haven't mentioned, let me know that's one of your favorites and, and we'll uh, include it. TSP is trisodium phosphate. That's what uh, like Dixie Bell White Lightning is. That's a cheap and easy way to get it and contain it and with instructions on it and you can feel safe. I think it's like five bucks or something like that. Um, other things that you can clean with are mineral spirits. Some people use Dawn dishwashing liquid. The thing is, you have to absolutely get any old residue of dust, grease, age, pledge, you know, lemon pledge, whatever you clean with. Everything like that has to come off. Old dust and dirt for your paint to adhere 
well. And when you use something like the uh, white lightning, that also deglazes a little bit. So that's going to take a little bit of the slickness of the surface off so that your paint is going to adhere well. If you think that little bit of dirt down in the corner crevice isn't going to matter, well it will because that that's going to sort of absorb your paint and then later on it's going to wipe off and you're going to have an area that doesn't have any paint so a lot of people say prep is not important and i'm not one of those people i believe it's very important so uh clean that there's crud cutter if it's you know old gummy something on there especially on hardware and stuff that can be good if you need if somebody has painted it with latex paint before the piece that you're working on and it didn't adhere well or even they used a, a chalky style furniture paint and it didn't adhere well because they didn't prep first then sometimes you want to use a stripper i don't do that very often maybe once or twice a year because i just don't like to but i use a citrus stripper it's like an orange oil type of a stuff and you paint it all on there cover it with plastic wrap and then come back and just sort of scrape the paint off but it still is a you know something you don't want to stick your hands in and all that if you don't have to but that's a tool that you need to have in your arsenal as, as well as gloves i use this kind <laughs> you can tell this box is pretty worn out and and they're expensive i mean i'm you know i'm not going to tell you they're cheap there's probably cheaper ones but and i don't wear them all the time but you need to wear them when you're cleaning with the tsp you need i wear them when i'm staining because how many times will you get stain under your fingernails before you say man just let me put a glove on um these fit well you can still feel everything well they don't have to be black i have a case of blue ones a case of clear ones I happened to get these black ones last time. There's been a shortage on this kind of stuff um, since all the shortages and stuff happened. So just whichever ones you can, can get. You can get those. I buy mine from webstrontstore.com, but you can get, you know, get them by a box at a time and you can get them at Lowe's or Home Depot or Harbor Freight or Northern Tool or a place like that, Amazon. I'll put a link to some. When I do the ebook, I'm going to put, uh, hopefully, I'll be able to make them clickable, but I'll put uh, links in there for all of my favorite things um, in case you want to check out more info on them. I don't even have these on my list, but I love these things, these little painting buckets. I use this one whenever I'm doing a little roller. I use this one whenever I'm uh, using my brush. And you can tell they're pretty well used. They're, very, they're, they're just handy because it just hangs on your hand like this. And if you're walking around to um, paint, it, that's very convenient. My brush right there is wet. But this one has a little magnet right here. So whenever I'm working on a big piece and I have that, I can stick my brush right there. And the ferrule, the metal part of it, is going to stick to that to keep the brush from sinking too deep, deep down into the paint. So these are not even on the list, but they're... This one's called the Handy Paint Cup, and this one's called the Handy Roller Cup. What I was going to uh, talk about are, this is a finishing pad. You use it at the end for buffing. I just buffed this piece with it this morning. Um, these you just get at Dollar Tree or Dollar General or wherever. They're um, just the cheap little things that have the scrubby part on the back and the sponge on one side. Sea sponges, which are good for giving you different techniques. These are, this one's called a gator hide sponge, but you can use a um, car wash sponge, which I've talked about that before. And if you get the big round car wash sponge, what you're looking for is the tiniest amount of little air pocket holes in here as you can. And another tip for this is, or if you're using the, uh, car wash sponge the car wash sponges are about this big around about this thick and you can take those and cut them into quarters is how i usually do it or cut it into halves so then you're going to have a flat side you can do that with this too but that goes against your um, flat edges see like this this is not going to go into that corner but if it was cut straight on one end you would go right into that corner and but if you put a knee-high stocking, an old piece of a pantyhose or whatever over this, that makes the holes even smaller and gives you an even smoother finish. So these are very important uh, for getting a smooth finished top coat. 
So whether you use this one or whether you use a car wash sponge, it with you know, or either one with a little stocking over it, these are applicator pads. These are well used. This one's stiff as a board right now, but because there's still a little white area right here that's good, I'm saving it. I stain mostly with these because you can just grab them with your hands and get them down in the stain and rub it on. And then I usually take another one to rub it off with. But I also apply like salves and Big Mama's Butter and uh, hemp oil and things like that with these. They're great for that. So, and one more thing is steel wool. If you're wanting a really, really smooth, slick finish, you can uh, lightly sand with maybe a 400 grit sandpaper in between and use water to help it flow or a good self-leveling paint. But you can also go in with that last layer and go over it with that triple or quadruple zero uh, steel wool and that really polishes it down good and, and that's what the finishing pad does as well this is soft you can get these in different sort of strengths I guess is a good way to put it so that covers sponges scrubbers steel wool sandpaper sanding sponges rags um, what I do is cut up old nightgowns old t-shirts you know every time my husband has I don't know how I, men get so many holes in their t-shirts and stained down the front of everything, but they they all go into my bucket of rags. So I keep those. Um, scrub brushes, things for cleaning, because it is important, and, you're with, and we're going to go more into sandpaper when we get down to the bottom. But um, So I'll stop on that right now. Mineral spirits, I think I mentioned that one already. Those are all things that you need for your prep even though the sandpaper would go up there. I'm gonna just say one thing about uh, scuff sanding. Scuff sanding is when you have the sandpaper and it's not a real coarse grit. Like a real coarse grit is about a, an 80. And the higher the number, the smoother it is, the more gentle it is. So an 80 is really rough. You can feel it being rough. That's gonna tear some gaps into your finish but if you're wanting to remove an old finish and remove it fast that's perfect for that but for scuff sanding i would probably use a 220 so you would go from 80 to 120 still a little bit rough and if it's if if it's tough you may could use a, a 120 but your 200 or your 220 is one that's going to just scuff that surface because all you're wanting to do is get a little bit of the glaze or the old finish roughed up so your paint has something it's called tooth create a little tooth so your paint has something to grab onto and so your finish will stay forever um and then you can go right on up to say a 400 is very very smooth a, a paper bag is about a 600. um okay tools in your toolbox uh Ones that I think are important are a ruler. I have a plastic ruler and a metal ruler. I have the six inch, the 12 inch, the uh, yardstick size, and you can use you know paint sticks for that. But there's a lot of times where you're gonna want things to be straight or you're gonna want things to be equally measured apart. And the ruler's just always in, you know, an important thing to have. There's what's called a T-square. And there's a, a, a little carpenter square. You don't necessarily need those unless you're going to start building your own furniture. And that's in a little more in-depth than what we would be doing with most of the preps. But uh, also a little level is really important. And I didn't write that on here. I'm going to write it on here right now. Um, and that's if you were going to be adding uh, a decoration here and here and you wanted them to be equal where well, you could take your ruler and measure down and take your ruler and measure up to get your center and then go from there. But you also can uh, then put, in case it's big, put, a, put your little level there to make sure that you're not getting it a little bit cockeyed. All that prep in advance definitely is worth it. Okay, painter's tape, same thing. If you're making, you want clean edges. Yesterday on the same piece, this is a fireplace. I taped around the fireplace so that I could paint easily. But you also um, tape over your hardware. Tape uh, 
If you're wanting straight lines to go around an edge, tape at the edge of that. If you're putting uh, stripes on a piece, another little tip there is to tear off a little bitty piece of your tape and you're gonna have a stripe the width of your tape, then put the little one here, then put your next tape, move this one over, and that way your lines will all be the same size all the way across. You'll use the painter's tape all the time, taping down your stencils, taping down uh, deciding in placement of your transfers and things like that. You'll use that a lot. Um, screwdrivers, hand tools. It, this is a, a claw hammer. If it was rubber up here, that would be a rubber mallet. Just create yourself a little toolbox and you'll need some flatheads and you'll need some uh, Phillips or stars because you're so, a lot of the times you can use your screw gun for taking off your hardware and things like that. Sometimes it's in an awkward place or it's smaller and you just you're gonna need them. I use these to after I've pulled my hardware off, I stab a regular screwdriver in the hole so that I can use that as leverage to open and close the drawers while it's being painted. Um, Everybody knows what a hammer is for. You're go you'll use it a lot, so it doesn't matter if you get an expensive one or just go buy one at the flea market. A hammer's a hammer as far as that goes for no more than, you know, than we would really need it. Um, wood glue, Gorilla Glue, E6000. Those are adhesives that I use a lot. I'm going to show you this. This is, this is one of my pride and joys here. This is a cordless glue gun it's not that you use a glue gun a lot on actual furniture but you're going to use it more than you think on different things i use it when using molds i will a lot of times make my mold impression with hot glue and instead of having to worry about where you're at finding another place to plug it in whether it's you know hot melt cool melt all those kind of things i love this one it's cordless you just slap your battery on there sit it aside and you can use it anywhere you need to. This was a good investment. I think they're probably $40 or something like that, but um, I've used electric skillets to hold hot glue when you're using it a lot. I use this more for wreath making and, and that kind of design, but just let you know that's something that I absolutely love of one of my tools. Utility knives, I was, you know, those are called box cutters when I was growing up. I use that all the time. Um, I don't use this much, but I'm going to show it to you. And I have used it, and it has been valuable to me. But this is called a miter box and saw. You can, this is where you can put in. These are about ten bucks, something like that. You can put in to cut angles for like corners or picture frames or molding that you wanted to say if you wanted to add some molding around here or even just cutting, cutting a piece of wood you bend or something like that. This is how you get the angles that are going to butt up in the corners like picture frames do. It's not easy to do. It does take some elbow grease. I, I do still use this from time to time, but I, I personally now use a compound miter saw. Can't show you that, but I do have a video on it if you... Um, Look on my YouTube channel, and, but that's down at a, at the other workshop. But anyway, so there are going to be several times and a lot of things you can cut with your utility knife. Um, would you bend? You can cut with your utility knife, but if it's big pieces of molding and things like that, you are going to need some kind type of miter saw. Um, claw hammer mallet, rubber mallet. We discussed that. Okay, now on your electric or battery operated tools. It's okay to start out with the electric, battery operated are fantastic, but you don't have to invest in the most expensive tools from the beginning. The I'll show you a couple of different ones here. These are sanders. This little one here um, was under 40 bucks, and you just change out the sandpaper on it. We can do a uh, if y'all are interested in knowing, you know, having a, a Power Tools 101, I'll do that and we'll go through a lot of these and how to use them and change the paper and, and the best things for that. But I do want to show you they generally have a little spout here on the end and a little bag that goes on there to hold the dust. It's important for what you breathe into your lungs plus the mess that you're going to make all over your 
room. But this one uh, is a, I don't know, a little palm sander. This one is called a random orbital sander. And this one was probably, this one's a DeWalt, which is a good quality tool. And this one was probably $150. You can see right now, this is not duct, well, this is actual duct tape, the metal kind, because that's what I had. This has the little bag taken off, and this is the end of my shop vac, my vacuum cleaner that I've got taped to it. And whenever I'm using this, a lot of times I want to sand inside, so you can't just have that dust everywhere. It's, it's just too much. Even when you do it a little bit, you're going to regret it later. Um... So I tape this on here and then I hook my vacuum cleaner hose to it and, and turn it on beside me. And this one's called a random orbital sander. And these are kind of like Velcroed on little, and you can get them in, you know, this is an 80 grit that's on here right now because we were taking the finish off of something yesterday. Uh, my granddaughter Jewel was using this. But you could get a dust collection system and spend a couple of grand on that if you're going to be sanding all the time. We have that at the big shop. But here in this studio and at the other studio, I use this and just hook it up to a shop vac. You can get a little bitty shop vac or a great big shop vac. We have small, medium, and large around here because it's something we use a lot to clean up with because it's good for sucking that dust out of all the crevices and things like that too. But um, this one is going to... you can change the speed up and down. This one is gonna, you gotta be careful that it doesn't give you circular motions. But this is something that's gonna save your shoulders and save your elbows. And believe me, I'm, I'm hurting all over right now because I don't use these enough. But they're great for when you wanna do uh, heavy distressing and things like that. But scuff sanding the, uh, the piece before you prep and all that. This is one of the things that I would buy in my first six months of being a furniture flipper. That's important. It doesn't have to be the DeWalt, but when it's something, when it's a tool that you use a lot, I do believe in getting the better brand. There's another one called a Surf Prep that I really want. I've been doing this for uh, 20 years and I still haven't invested in it yet because it just blows my mind to spend, you know, 600 bucks on a sander. But I'm, I'm going to get it, and I'll show it to y'all once I eventually do that. Okay, so you have your random orbital sander, your paper that goes on it, your palm sander, compound miter saw. And I do have a video on this, too, um, uh, in the YouTube. That's where you have the big, it looks like a, a circular saw. Like, this is my circular saw. Uh, but this one... It's like this is on a lever. You put your board in the bottom and then you push this down on it and it cuts. So you're only cutting those angles right there. So it's similar to this. And I like this cordless one. Don't use it very often, but if I was putting a new top on something or needed you know, to cut a piece, this is easy and nice to have. They make them smaller and I may get me a smaller one in the future. But and your battery would slap on right there. That's... Um, a table saw, um, you don't need it in the beginning, but it's for cutting strips of longer pieces of wood or cutting plywood and things like that if you get into making tables and things like that. The dust collection system, shop vac is plenty to start with. Um, drill and screw guns, they're a lot of times, and, and I have another one here. Well, I'll show you a few right here. Um, sometimes I leave because this is something I use all the time. Uh, this one has a star bit in it. This one has a Phillips in it. And this teeny one is not used very often, but it can get into little small places, um, taking and, and putting in hardware and repairing drawers and things like that. Uh, I'll usually have one that I keep drill bits in, one that I keep... Uh, tips in and this craftsman is really good um this is from back when sears was still the only place with craftsman and here's how your little battery comes off of there i try you'll notice that most of my tools are ryobi that's this bright green um and the reason for that is i bought them as a kit for one but for two you want to be able to use um 
the same batteries on any of it so you're not packing 50 different batteries and 50 different chargers, chargers and all that with you and it seems like a very large investment because you're looking at you know maybe another hundred and fifty dollars for an extra charger and an extra couple of batteries but it's so worth it if you're going to be traveling to do your stuff and you don't have a place to plug it in you can roll this up put it in there have a couple of extra batteries always have one charging while you're using one this is um let's see what this is the one that goes to my little craftsman tool that was there um so it's important to have the extra charger and extra batteries and but this same battery comes off of here is the same one that i use in my glue gun it's the same one i use in my circular saw the same one i've used in all of the ryobi tools so that's what makes that so cool i don't want to put it in there and i do want to put it in here because this is my most used tool so get what you can doesn't have to be expensive but think about if you plan on continuing in this business and growing this in the future picking a brand that you want this is a good brand ryobi is i think that's home depot's brand um where uh lowe's now owns craftsman craftsman used to be sears um or dewalt which is great but they're you know not twice as expensive but a good bit more expensive but a high quality tool so that the you know just being able to exchange the or tra trade the batteries out with them is enough to make it worthwhile to stick with the same brand okay drill screw gun didn't bring this in here but a crock pot i have a small dedicated crock pot and buy it at goodwill use an old one that you have in your kitchen buy yourself a new one but those I use to put all my hardware in for cleaning. Whenever I, I get a piece, even if it doesn't look like it's you know needs that much cleaning, I take them all off, chunk them into a crock pot, turn it on, leave it in there overnight with water, and uh, to clean those out. So and I, I think that's important to have an inexpensive sawzall. I don't use this as much. But I have used it, you know, maybe a half dozen times. You can get big, it has a long blade that comes out here. And you can get wood blades, metal blades, you know, different kinds of blades to go on it. Same battery would slap in here. But uh, it's called a reciprocating saw. But in the trade, it's called a sawzall. Because it'll saw anything. And this is where, say, you had a, a big board right here. If you had a dresser that you wanted to change the legs out of this is something i'm fixing to do i want something to look more mid-century modern but it right now it has queen anne legs on it or something or just craftsman style square legs i can use this and cut those legs off flush with the bottom of the piece and then put my new legs in there and so it does come in handy you don't use it all the time you don't have to get it in the beginning but when if you're using a handsaw to do stuff like that uh, you definitely this this would be your next investment if that's something you're you know going to do a good bit um let's see a cutting tool and i don't know where it's at i tried to get it here this morning but i used it in a recent video for cutting i had a, a vanity you know the old-fashioned vanity with the two nightstands on the side and the vanity part in the middle and i used my sawzall the one i just showed you to cut through that this is what the metal part's good for i cut right through the nails that were holding it together to cut that off but at the bottom it had a decorative scalloped kind of piece that and only one of them had it so i'm like that's got to go because i don't want i can either try to route out and make another one just like it that's your option with uh one of your probably with a skill a uh, jigsaw um which is another i don't have one here with me mine's electric and and not uh cordless but anyways this cutting tool and and that's what we've always called it it's about like your dremel this is a dremel but it has just a little flat part at the end and you can zip, 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 and cut through anything with it pretty quickly so i do have a i, I used that in a vanity to nightstand video this is a dremel uh 
Oh, the battery's not dead in it. But you can get all kinds of different tips for this. This has a, a sanding tip on it right now, but you can get buffing tips, point, diamond pointed tips. But this is really good for wallowing out larger holes, for sanding in, you know, smoothing out or sanding in areas that are hard to get to, buffing things. I use this all the time as well. So that's your Dremel tool. Heat gun here. Just used this yesterday. This gets used uh, uh, more than you think. It's not every day, but it is worth the investment and it is not a blow dryer. I do have a blow dryer, which is important to add to the um, list. And I used the blow dryer, used it yesterday on this to dry the piece faster so that you can move on to the next step. But a heat gun, this thing gets to like 1800 degrees. You would never actually touch this part that I'm touching right here. And this one plugs in, this one's Porter Cable, which is another really good brand of tools. But you use this for stripping old paint. If you don't wanna use a chemical stripper because you don't like to be around uh, strippers, <laughs> because you don't be, like to be around chemicals, and uh, you heat up the paint with this, you gotta be very careful because you know, it can be, create a fire, but you cause that to bubble up, then you scrape that paint off. Get the next set, scrape that off. We used it yesterday. In fact, I, I allowed my 14-year-old granddaughter to use it with after instruction, but to, I had a, a piece that was decoupaged with a thick uh, photograph poster type thing on top of it, and we needed that off so that we could then sand it. She was using the random Orville sander after that but we needed to scrape that off first and most of the decoupage or the adhesive. And so we heat that up and scrape, heat that up and scrape with a putty knife. So this is uh, important for removing things and heating things up. So if you want to use this for stripping in, instead of a chemical, it's a good way to do it. And it's also good for removing decoupage and things like that. And, and I use it a lot. Um, an iron. I do have one over there, but we all know what an iron is. I, I iron, I, I use the iron-on method for decoupage the most of all, and that's where you put your clear coat satin or your Mod Podge or whatever you're going to use down on your surface, let it dry, then put your wrapping paper or whatever thing that you're going to decoupage on top of it, and then you iron it with a, a warm iron, and that reactivates the adhesive on the bottom and sticks your paper to it without you having to get wrinkles in the paper, without you having to have everything uh, lined up perfectly, laying it in the globby stuff, back out of the globby stuff, just getting frustrated with it. You, you lay it on there dry. You iron it. Some people put parchment paper over. I do have a video on this on YouTube as well. But you just iron it on and then you put another coat of your decoupage medium on top of that to seal it and boom you're done so i do use the iron when i'm decoupaging and probably can't see it here but this is a good size rolling cart and i have uh three over there of the three compartment little rolling carts and the way that i use them other than all the time for everything is when i'm working on a project I will take everything that I'm going to need for that project and load it on that cart. So uh, everything for prep, everything, every kind of paint, every kind of sealer, my transfer molds, paper clay, whatever I'm going to use on the top will be my brushes, my water uh, container, my mister bottle, everything that you need. So I can then roll that over, put it beside the project, and everything stays together instead of all over my studio. And that is fantastic um drop cloths and tarps we talked about that in the last video you're going to probably ruin the floor of wherever you're at so if it's a a place that you really can't do that make sure and have good uh, drop cloths tarps or something taped down and around to take care of that now for the miscellaneous things that you absolutely need but don't fall under the other categories Extension cords and power strips. You want to make sure and get the nice um, orange, usually, extension cords, the big, thick one. They'll have like a 12-gauge, which is a really strong one, or a 20-gauge, which is usually all we need. I like to use a 12 for the heat gun, but for everything else, you can use a 20-gauge 
the larger the number, the weaker the wire. And But the little household extension cords are likely not enough for when you're using a, uh, your other. And this is a brad nailer uh, and, and also a stapler. And I just did the video on uh, reupholstering chairs was done showing on the stapler. But this is sort of like a big stapler. Takes my same battery as everything else. But you put uh, either staples or little brad nails in here. And if you were, say, and a lot of times we have to do this, put a new back on. Anyways, something. you use this nailer if you, and I did this in a recent video as well on, on a vanities. Sometimes you have to put a new back on something. Nowadays, I don't know why, but it seems like it's practically cardboard, the backing that they put on furniture. And you at least need quarter inch plywood or luon or something like that on there, but you would cut the pieces out to size straight and then boom, 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 tack it in and it's done. You can use screws, but then you're gonna be boom, boom. This is a lifesaver time saver anyways and time is valuable time is money okay brushes that's where we're going to have obviously you're a painter your synthetic brushes your let's see if i can pull this out for you to see i did not have this prepped and ready this is what i was painting with yesterday this is a synthetic brush this is a dixie bell mini my very favorite brush i used it painting this yesterday um this is an artist brush this is a one inch flat I used it in here. This is an artist brush. And this one's just a quarter inch flat. Um, this is a synthetic brush, I mean a natural bristle brush. That's like a paint pixie. This is a paint pixie number four, I think. And this one is a number eight. And wax brush. Um, you need different brushes and brushes are an important tool to invest your money in because the quality of your finish comes from the quality of your brush use the synthetic bristle brush whenever you're using an all-in-one paint like silk or something like that or when you're wanting a very smooth surface you can use your natural excuse me, your natural bristle brush whenever you are uh, wanting a more textured finish i use it the that brush, the Paint Pixie brushes, when I used the DIY clay-based paint, and I used, just to see the difference, I used the uh, natural bristle brush on the feet because I wanted them a little more textured and I wanted this a little more smooth, so I used my synthetic brush there. Get at, get as the best you can afford at the time. To me, the Dixie Bell Mini is my favorite, but I use a, a lot of the others as well. But um, if you can't afford that yet, there's the Purdy, P-U-R-D-Y. They have those at Sherwin-Williams and Lowe's, and they're, I don't know, maybe $15, $18 or something like that where versus $30 for the, uh, the mini. But you will have that same brush if you take care of it for the entire rest of your career. Um, house painters, they generally have their one good Purdy uh, Purdy cutting in brush and then their rollers. But so you can add to that collection, but you're gonna gonna need at least, you know, a couple of sizes of each for that. And then the chip brushes, which are the cheap ones, I buy them by the case. You're supposed to throw them away after every job. I'm too cheap for that. I throw them away after, I don't know, every third or fourth job. I cut the tips off of them and then I use them for stenciling and things like that, but they're not what I would put a finish on uh, a piece of furniture with and then rollers um, when you're doing long flat surfaces like the sides whoa the sides of furniture or cabinet doors and things like that that's when a roller comes in handy and we can discuss that in another video on choosing it's called your nap the part that slides on is called your nap the different nap styles and sizes as to whether you want a smooth finish or a textured finish and those kind of things but they're I I have the regular size I think they, they have a nine inch an eight inch a six inch a four inch and a three inch I usually use a four inch and a nine inch 
and you buy your roller and then that's the same one that you use near about forever for years anyways and then you just buy the replacement naps and if you get a good nap you can wash it and reuse it as well or you can buy disposables rags we talked about shop towels that's the blue paper towels they're sturdier kind of like a viva paper towel and pick up more stuff um applicator pads finishing sponges paints, top coats. Next week we're going to talk about the different paints and I'll go over that in a minute. Your finishes, like your clear coats, your wax, hemp oil, butter, glaze, all of those. Mud, which can be your drywall mud, Dixie Bell mud, and I know I forgot to write on here the uh, additives. Um, and that would be like the DIY frosting or the uh, salt whatever it's called, the salt stuff that you add in to change the texture of the paint. We'll discuss those next week. Um, brush cleaner, whether it's the scrubby soap, Dawn dishwashing liquid, or whether you get a stronger brush cleaner. Bondo is uh, kind of like they use in the automotive in industry. That works similar to your mud and similar to wood filler or wood putty as far as filling in gaps and holes and missing veneer and making raised stencils and stuff like that. It's nice to have a small variety of that. Um, wood conditioner, um, you don't always have to use it, but I do, um, I do always use it when it's new wood. And a lot of times if I've taken the complete surface or past sealer off of, of another piece, I use wood conditioner. I use the Barathane brand. You can usually get that at Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever. Your stains, screws, nails, putty knives, containers to keep your water in, trays, um, and then the sandpaper, we talked about that earlier. A couple of coarse ones, you know, a stack of coarse ones, 60 and 80 grit, your medium grits, 120 and 200, and your fine grits, your 300 to your 600s, because they all, along with your steel wool, they all have a different purpose. And if you wanted to sand between coats and you ended up all you had on hand was an 80 grit sandpaper, you're gonna ruin your whole finish. You're gonna cry. You're gonna have to take it all off, strip it all down and start over. And you don't wanna do that. Um, you need a, a place and a way to store your brushes because they are valuable tools. I have, I'll do a tour in here one day. It's a mess right now because I have so many projects going on, but um, Whatever you can find that works as a way. I, I use storage bins to, to, say, to store my brushes. I have brush hangers. But the one thing that I can highly recommend that I absolutely love is after I wash my brushes, I have a baby bottle drying rack. You know, the one that has the little grass looking prongs that come up in it. And that'll your brushes will stand up in that to let all the water drain out of there because if you lay it down and water stays in there for one it can rust your ferrule the metal part that holds your um, this it can rust your ferrule the metal part that holds your bristles in but also these bristles are glued inside there to the handle before your ferrule is is put on and you can weaken that adhesive by leaving it in water for too long. So I never wash my wax brushes, just as another tip. And I do have a blog post and a video about that. Um, but you put them in that, let's see if I can make that happen. No, anyways, if you put them in that bo baby bottle drying rack, it lets all that get out of them until, and you can leave it in there a couple of days and then put them back where they belong. Um, you need a utility sink as soon as you can get one. That's the big one that you can let get stained up. However, and that's important no matter what. It, however, use what sink you've got until you can get your own shop set up for that. If you have a septic tank, if you have a, if I live in a rural area, there's no city sewer here. People have a septic tank. Um, paint is not good for your septic tank. It's going to mess things up. It's going to settle down in the bottom with the sediment and it's going to prevent the water from draining from your tank which is what how that whole system works you don't want that to happen and have a you know several thousand dollar mistake on your hands i keep a five gallon bucket and we'll say this was my water bucket 
I'll rinse my brushes out real good in here and chunk this into my five gallon bucket, put clear water in here, rinse them again, dump it in my five gallon bucket, and then I just let it sit there. All that water evaporates, and then if, you, if you've been a month without painting something and dumping water in there, you can actually just peel out this big layer of paint that's in the bottom of your bucket, and that's what would have been in your septic system. So the five gallon bucket is invaluable to me. Um, bins, tables, shelving, Mine is all put together by what I was able to salvage out of, out of my store after the hurricane. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I wish it looked cute in here. Maybe one day it'll look cute in here. Right now I need it to be workable in here. Um, so that, well, putty knives, screws, nails. I think I've gone over all of it. Stain, wood conditioner. That's all of it. Those are the main tools of the trade that... I feel like everybody needs to start with or within your first, you know, say by three years in, you need to um, have reinvested all of your profits. That's kind of the way that, you know, that business works. A lot of people think I'm going to get into this, flip furniture, buy something for a hundred, put a hundred in it, sell it for 400, make a hundred profit, go spend that on dinner tonight. Well, your business is never going to grow enough for you to be able to buy these tools out of, have your business buy these tools. The, Carrie Stovall didn't buy these tools. Sister of the Traveling Brush bought these tools. Um, and therefore, they are tax deductible because they are part of my business. But reinvest for that first couple of years until you can get everything that you think you'll use. And then there's more that, you know, um, but that, that'll come up and different things that I may have forgotten to mention, but I, I did my best to have an all exhaustive list. And if you can think of something else, like I said, DM me, comment in here. I can't see the uh, comments or anything right now because I'm blind and I'm too far away from the camera, but I will circle back around and get to those. And next week, episode four is choosing what is best uh for your project as far as paints. And I think I'll go ahead and go into top, no, we had top coats a different different week. Okay, we should be able to narrow this down and get it into 20, 30 minutes next week. But we're gonna talk about making your own like chalk or clay-based paint. I have videos on both of those on my YouTube channel. Using latex paint like Sherwin-Williams or you know some of the other brands, latex and chalk, water-based, oil-based, acrylic-based clay paints like DIY and mud paint, chalk paints like Annie Sloan who owns the word chalk paint. The rest of them are chalky style paints um, like the Paint Pixie Magical Chalk Paint, Jolie Paint, the Walmart brand, I can't remember the name of it. Um, and there are differences in those. Just because they have chalk in them doesn't make them all equal. It, it matters how many pigments are in there and what the carriers are and all those. Then you have your acrylic chalk-based paints like Dixie Bell, your Farmhouse, your Junk Monkey. You have your mineral paints that don't have chalk in them like uh, your all-in-one paints like your Heirloom Traditions and Silk. You have craft paints like your little deco art paints. You have your artist paints like the come in a tube, your acrylic paints. And all of those can and probably will be used on your projects. And we're going to um, discuss each of them and, and where and how you decide which one of them is best to use for any particular project and any given time. I hope to see you then. Bye. Thanks for joining me.